Hello and welcome back. For today's podcast, we're joined by Dr. David Gowing from the Open University, who is speaking with us about his floodplain meadow restoration work at the Floodplain Meadow Partnership. David describes how meadows have been essential for the survival of British communities for millennia, their crucial role in biodiversity, where the situation now stands, and why to be excited about the future. If you like this episode and would like to follow more on this project, please follow the links in the description. And if you'd like to support us, you can make a donation at restoreourplanet.org or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Enjoy the conversation. Hello, and welcome back to our Restore Our Planet podcast with me, your host, Jack Cole. Today, I'm joined by Dr. David Gowing from the Open University, who's been working on, who has been working on meadows and meadow restoration for about 30 years now. So David, welcome, and tell us a little bit about your, your background and your, your current work. Hi, Jack. I'm a botanist and I'm an academic researcher at the Open University. Um, so I did my original PhD on the interactions between vegetation and hydrology and started to use meadows as a area for gathering data. And that has gradually built up over the years. Um, and now I'm a, a full time researcher in meadows. Fantastic, you're right. So tell us a little bit some of the basics there. So what is a meadow and what are the different types? Okay, so a, a meadow um, comes literally from the word to cut in Old English. Um, so it's a grassland that is cut for hay um, rather than a pasture, which is a grassland that's grazed by animals through the year. So meadows have been important um, for several thousand years because they enable people to keep livestock through the winter so gathering hay is important as a way of storing food to feed animals through the winter and there are numerous different types the one i specialize in is uh, those growing on floodplains so that receive floods regularly that makes them sustainable in terms of being able to produce hay um, year in year out. You get other types on drier areas um, and even up in the mountains you get the alpine meadows um, that also produce hay but they can't be cut every year because they don't have the nutrient supply that floodplains do. All right fantastic so tell me a little bit about maybe the sort of the, you mentioned that they've been around for a few thousand years. Um, so what are some of the perhaps sort of more historic aspects of meadows that, we, uh, that we've learned? Okay. Well, um, we think that the Romans probably brought them to Britain um, and we found uh, scythes um, around Roman forts where they were gathering hay to keep their horses through the winter. So they have been in Britain for approximately 2000 years um, and they were the dominant land use in floodplains ever since doomsday they were recorded in the doomsday book and <clears throat> monastic uh, records and tide maps etc have shown that the majority of British floodplains were used for meadow throughout that period and we've even done some work looking at the size of meadows correlating to the size of settlement they supported. And there's quite a good correlation there. So we think possibly that the size of a, a rural community may have been determined by the amount of um, floodplain it had to supply hay to keep um, the livestock through the winter. So it was considered really valuable land in medieval times so the land changed hands for higher prices than arable land for example because the special thing about floodplains is they do receive floods and sediment and therefore nutrients every year with a flood depositing them um, and that makes them a sustainable system so you can get a heavy crop each year without adding anything back and that persisted through until the beginning of the, the last century, sort of in the 1930s, suddenly artificial fertilizer began to become available. Um, and very quickly, these meadows that had underpinned the rural economy for several hundred, possibly more than a thousand years, lost 
their uniqueness. Suddenly you could grow grass wherever you were able to spread fertilizer. Um, and so these particular systems lost their economic importance. And probably between the 1930s and the 1980s, they really weren't viewed as having any value. Then in the 70s and 80s, people start to realize that they were also one of the most diverse vegetation types in the country. And in terms of biodiversity conservation, they were very important. And so they have been protected um, ever since then. But unfortunately, that 50 year gap, when they weren't deemed to have value um, either economically or in terms of conservation because they had been so widespread that nobody imagined that meadows would ever be threatened and um, nature conservationists didn't, didn't focus on them and we think something like 98 percent of all the meadows in the country were lost in that 50-year period um, so they are now very rare and, and very special the species rich examples on on floodplains and that's what we're now working to try and conserve. And were they, so you mentioned pastures before and growing of grass, was, were they, was it basically replaced meadows with a different type of farming or was it sort of that, uh, development of, you know, housing? What, what exactly yeah, replaced it, the old meadows? It, it was a real mixture. Um, yeah, the change in um, farming systems that happened with the arrival of artificial fertilizer meant one of the um, steps in, of intensification was to spread nitrogen on grass to get it to grow faster. Um, and that allowed multiple silage crops to be taken. So silage is different from hay. It, you cut the grass, but you wrap it up while it's still moist and it basically ferments and pickles itself and that silage is then used again to feed the cattle particularly dairy cattle over the winter and um, so the old method of leaving hay to air dry in the fields um, for several days was replaced by this silage system which was more productive because um, you could take several crops in one year when hay is generally one or possibly two crops in a year. Um, so that intensification of the agriculture accounted for the loss of quite a few of the meadows, but other things such as urbanization, floodplains are nice flat pieces of land alongside the routes of communication. Most of our major roads and railways follow river valleys um, and are built on floodplain. And so a lot of urban development has happened in our floodplains. Um, furthermore, our floodplains are quite often built on um, terraces of sands and gravels because of at the end of the last ice age, as the glaciers melted, they had a lot of power and they were scouring um, the landscape and depositing these core sediments in the valleys. And those are now very um, economically valuable for uh, building construction um, and so across the country the deposits of sand and gravel are being dug out of our floodplains um, which entails the loss of the meadow on the surface um, and because removing the gravel then changes the hydrology of the system it's very difficult to re-establish the meadows that were there before. So I think those are the three big changes that happened and particularly in those 50 years when there was a lot of economic uh, um, development, a lot of urban growth and an intensification of agriculture, um, particularly with the common agricultural policy trying to um, drive up productivity. Those three drivers caused the loss of, of the traditional meadows. Okay. Um... So you mentioned there, obviously, the loss of biodiversity. I, I've actually been reading quite a lot recently about uh, silent spraying and the, sort of the, the rise of the use of pesticides following sort of, you know, fears over food shortages sort of following, the, following the, the Second World War. Um, I was wondering, what, what do you know, what more specifically, in, perhaps in terms of data, um, what, what, how catastrophic were actually the losses as a result of the uh, destruction of these meadows? Well, the... Um... Yes, the, the loss of the traditional meadow 
had a big impact in terms of biodiversity because the vegetation in a traditional meadow can um, be the, some of the most species rich um, in the entire of Britain um, with 40 different species of plant growing in a single square meter is what you can find in, in nice examples of old meadows. Um, and if you intensify the production methods, so rather than relying on the natural processes of sediment deposition, um, followed by an annual hay crop, you are adding nutrients artificially, which quite often goes hand in hand with um, using pesticides to um, remove the broadleafed herbs from the system so that there's more space for the grasses that are the most productive plants. Um, so that became a general trend um, following the Second World War and, and the drive to increase productivity. Um, so species richness dropped from perhaps being 30 or species per square meter to just three or four. And because you've lost that diversity of plants, you lose the diversity of insects that rely on them. And if you lose the insects, you lose the birds and um, other higher trophic levels. So I think loss of meadows um, played a big part in the change in our rural biodiversity and pollinators being another um, example that it's now the effect is being realized of what's happened by removing these traditional systems from the farm landscape um, has caused huge declines in both the diversity and the abundance of uh, invertebrates and then up the, the food chain um, other species have suffered as well. Okay so this might be a good time for you to tell us a little bit about your work and the work going on over the Floodplains uh, Meadow Partnership and so yeah. Okay well <laughs> um, as I said my involvement started as a researcher and we were gathering data from um, a lot of meadows around the country to understand how changes in river engineering affected the diversity of these meadows um, and it became apparent over time that all the sites we'd visited um, other groups such as um, the Environment Agency or Natural England were interested in um, and were asking us to um, provide some data to help them uh, assess the impacts of developmental development changes um, on the meadows. Uh, and so we decided to avoid reinventing the wheel and writing the same sort of report again and again for meadows up and down the country. We'd form a partnership with these organizations to pool our knowledge and resources um, to share the information and to gather data more systematically. So the Floodplain Meadows Partnership grew out of that. Um, we now have 10 um, organizational members representing all the um, bodies who are interested in conserving this habitat type. Um, and we've sustained long-term monitoring at fixed points to really understand um, what the drivers are for conserving um, and sustaining these meadows. We now have data sets that are yeah, up to 30, 30 years long. Um, and out of that, we've been able to um, share good practice in terms of how to conserve uh, and restore species-rich examples of these meadows. And um, most of our emphasis is now on restoration. There are several hundred schemes going on around the country where um, the, the wheel has sort of turned and now it's recognized that these traditional systems provide um, a lot more benefit than was realized back in the 50s and 60s when they were being plowed or sprayed. Um, and so with government support through some of the um, land management schemes like countryside stewardship, more support is given to landowners 
to conserve and restore these meadows. And so a lot of the work of the partnership now is providing the sort of advice and support for those um, wishing to restore them and monitoring their success so that because it is a long term uh, process to restore one of these meadows um, to do it fully is several decades and uh, it's important because they are such dynamic systems to have some monitoring in place and um, a lot of what we do is reassuring people that okay their restoration scheme may not look ideal this year because there were heavy floods the previous year perhaps um, but they are very dynamic systems you just need to keep managing them in a traditional way and uh, they will recover. Fantastic and what are some of the more practical aspects of meadow management sort of for example like you know green hay spreading and other other methods? Okay um, so in terms of restoring an area to species rip from a meadow and the key thing is the ability to cut it each year as was done traditionally so um, you know, sometimes that's the area that people need support with perhaps sharing machinery to do the, the hay cut and um, finding ways to market the hay is important so that's the sort of um, step one is to ensure that you have the ability to to cut the hay each year um, then in terms of diversifying the uh, sward so adding species to it there are several methods um, the simplest being just to, to wait for species to arrive but that can be a slow process now because old meadows are so fragmented and uh, diverse for, um, thinly spread through the landscape that um, species arriving on their own uh, is a fairly rare event so we give them a helping hand by spreading seed on new sites so you can harvest seed by hand or by brush harvesting with a tractor from old species rich sites and then taking that seed and spreading it on a receiver site and um, that's quite labor intensive so um, alternative methods are simply to cut and spread the hay rather than separate out the seeds um, and the simplest way of doing that is just to cut hay as you wood um, and bale it on uh, a species rich site and then feed it to the cattle on the new site during autumn and let the cows kick the um, hay around and tread it in and some of the seeds will go through the cow and out the other end um, and be deposited on the meadow and that can be quite successful but um, a preferred route for many is to spread the hay green which means cutting um, the hay from an existing species rich meadow and spreading it the same day um, on the receiver site. And it's important to do it quickly because it's rather like your compost heap. If the, fray, if the hay is fresh and full of moisture, it will start to heat up quite quickly. Um, and so that needs to be done quickly. So you gather it with a a silage maker which is just like a, a lawnmower collecting cuttings in a box and then using a agricultural muck spreader to spread that hay um, green hay back out onto a, a receiver site um, and that has the advantage that um, if you've cut it at the right time the hay will be absolutely full of seed if you're making hay um, traditionally and turning it to dry it a lot of the seed falls out in that process and um, so the green hay can be um, richer in seed and it's also believed to bring other key ingredients like um, fungal spores that are important in helping um, species to, to re-establish on, on soils that may have been in arable management in the past and have lost a lot of their natural fungal flora. Um, so those are the, the key methods of diversifying grassland um, but the the key thing is to sustain the management over time that um, the, the landowner of a restored site really has to um, buy into making hay regularly as part of their normal farming system um, 
and the move in recent years towards grass-fed meat as a sustainable option is, is really important. Um, so the, those are animals that have been grazed typically during the summer and then are fed um, hay over winter. So they're not eating any um, arable crops with the issues that has for cultivating the soil and competing with human food streams. Um, they entirely based on on grass systems um, is a very sustainable way of uh, producing food, um, and so we're expecting hay to become more in demand as a as a crop, and to encourage um, farmers to move back to the traditional systems um, that were used the nineteenth century and and before. Right. So, how do you feel things are? shaping up you mentioned it's quite a long-winded process to restore a meadow decades perhaps yeah but you said you do you do have hundreds of instances yeah. and places dotted around the country what would you like to see over the next sort of decade or 15 years or how do you um, feel things are trending yeah well the things are positive at the moment i mean there are schemes such as countryside stewardship that support um farmers to move back into these systems um the drawback is the farmer signs up for just five or ten years with no guarantee of um, support after that. So we're hoping that the new um, environmental land management scheme that should appear this year um, will take a longer term view and um, support this sort of restoration um, over a longer time frame, which I think will give more people confidence to engage with it. We've set the target of restoring 70,000 hectares um, in England and Wales, um, because we think it needs to be on that scale to deliver some of the key ecosystem services that floodplain meadows can um, provide, such as trapping sediment, so that when we get big floods, um, all the infrastructure like bridges, um, and weirs downstream aren't completely clogged with, with sediment being washed off arable fields. Um, and alongside that, extracting nutrient from that sediment um, to, for a positive use in terms of uh, producing hay, rather than allowing it to pollute the water um, and therefore improve water quality and the value of the aquatic habitat. So if our floodplains were covered as they formerly were with hay meadow, um, you'll have a lot better quality of water in the river. Um, and also with climate change um, causing more intense rainfall events, the likelihood of flood is going to increase over time. Um, and therefore we need a means of controlling and managing the risks and floodplain meadows um, in their traditional state where rivers are, are free to spread across them during a flood peak and then the water returns to the channel once the peak has passed um, is a, an effective and easy way of managing a flood. Um, the, the problem being that a lot of our rivers became embanked um, in the sort of post-war period where, with people having a view to draining the land and using it more intensively. Um, but there's now a movement to remove those embankments and let the um, system work on natural processes um, rather than pump drainage. Um, and, and floodplain meadows are an ideal land use in that, in that situation. So we think if there's sufficient uh, area of these meadows, they would protect us against floods, they would improve our water quality, they would um, manage the sediment much more effectively and stop so much of our soil being lost to the sea. Um, and then also we're finding that they're very effective at storing carbon, that the deep alluvial soils beneath these meadows are very rich in carbon. Um, something like 200 tonnes per hectare of carbon is sitting in those soils which is more than woodlands, for example, um, and in some cases as much as, as peatlands. So 
we're keen to um, diversify the types of land management that are used for carbon um, sequestration. So uh, all the uh, publicity has tended to be around trees and peat, but um, species rich grassland on, on alluvial soils particularly uh, is an important player in that story as well. Um, so that's a lot of our current work is trying to gather evidence to, to show what role these grasslands could play. Fantastic. And finally, David, where can people find your work and, and follow you? Okay, um, so the Floodplain Meadow Partnership has uh, its own website, which is simply floodplainmeadows.org. Um, and so if you go online um, to that site, there are uh, newsletters explaining what we do, and uh, you can sign up to receive a, a newsletter twice a year. Uh, there's also lots of case studies, so people who are interested in um, managing or uh, restoring or creating a meadow, then there will be um, case studies that they can read through to find out what others have done and what has succeeded. Um, and there are other pages that just explain the, the history and encourage people to engage with meadows in whatever way suits them. So we've run art competitions and we've had some extraordinary works of art um, reflecting the impact meadows have had on these people. Um, so you can explore all of that on our, our website. But um, I mean, something we, we should have mentioned as, as well as all these practical benefits I've been describing, meadows are the most amazing um, features in the landscape that in full bloom, there's really nothing um, to compare to them. And, and they really have uh, an emotional impact on, on many people, um, which you know, we should celebrate. Absolutely. David, thank you for your time.